fish today, KC. Good morning. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. It's Wednesday. It's another episode of the um, weekly tech forum uh, sponsored by Love My Tool. Again, we have um, uh, our usual panel today. We have uh, Casey, Paul, and uh, and Tim. Um, everyone say hello. Uh, not all hello. at once, but uh, Casey, go first. Hello. Good evening. Uh, it is 12.30 in Georgia. And uh, and Tim? Buenos dias, buenas tardes, buenas noches. It's bien dies aquí. And on top of that, uh, guten tag and... Uh, uh, so was that you, you just you, that, that was just a that, that was just a lunch menu, right? Yeah, that was my lunch menu. Yeah, yeah I, that's what I thought because I heard the the word uh, uh, enchiladas in there somewhere. <laughs> no, I said I, actually I said it's, it's it's being a key. It's very good here. So. <laughs> actually, morning, we're having Mark, a, a, Mark an just, Indian summer. Mark, Mark just joined us. Good morning. Um, and then uh, how, how about you say hello first, Mark, and then we go to the Paul. <laughs> okay. Hi, how you doing? And that's Mark Thompson. Um, and then finally, Paul. Paul actually just finished a uh, a course, a lecture in um, in UK, and um, he's getting ready to um, have a few drinks. But before that, he he thought maybe he'll uh, he'll uh, he'll have a mini lecture. Good evening, Paul. Hi, hi, Denny. Hi, everyone. Yeah, I'm uh, here in London, and in London it's about half past five in the evening. So I'm looking to uh, going home. I think Paul would be much more loquacious after he has a few shots. Um, yeah, it, you can tell that he's, you know, he's he's just want to get out of here now. Well, probably <laughs> a in, incomprehensible after a few shots. I <laughs> so, um, so Paul has uh, prepared a, a mini lecture for us. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, um, <laughs> but before he does that, is there anything that uh, anybody else want to talk about, Tim? Uh, any, any? Um, I, I, I actually got your itinerary now. That you're actually coming out to Shockfest for sure. Yep, I'm coming. Midsurf told me that if I didn't, he'd find me and hurt me. And uh, so, uh, no, I, I'm really looking forward to it. I've got a couple of presentations. I'm going to do um, an opening talk about the technology history because I go back to the building the first data scope. Um, uh, and many other diagnostic tools over the years. So we're going to talk about that, um, and uh, that's my going to be my opening talk. And then I'm going to do one on the, the um, anatomy of a cyber attack. And then wow. then I'm going to do one on the neurophysiology, actually how attacks work once they get in the systems. And I'm going to break down at least four different attacks with trace files and um, go through the different types. You know. They're they're great examples because they're all they're all sort of similar, uh, but uh, uh, it, and I'm going to use Wireshark of course as my visualization tool with a tap, no span ports allowed, and uh, so um, I'm looking forward to it. I'm also talked last night at Kennesaw State University, and I'm going to try to get uh, one of the professors a scholarship uh, to go to it. So. It's, I'm looking forward to it, and Denny, you'll have to put up me for a whole week. I don't know if you can handle that. That will test your 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 Buddhist philosophy about being kind to old farts. I mean, to older gentlemen. <laughs> no, I, I already have a solution. I'll, I'll let you know in a minute. Uh oh, taser time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and one thing that I think, uh, since we are uh, talking about security. How about the uh, new technology that's going to be coming out where they're uh, talking in Congress about enacting a law where the cars mandated will be mandated to talk to one another and the security implications uh, and safety issues with uh, hacking and cracking of those systems and causing the brakes or whatever. If I didn't like you, you know, eh, I'll make your brakes or your car swerve and whatever. And the biggest thing that I know that our government will say is, well, nobody can do that. Well, if that's the case and everything can be so secure, then why do we have so much identity fraud and Internet fraud going on if all this stuff is so secure? Did you watch TV last night where they actually, a hacker flipped a car on a, on a guy? No, that was, I didn't. On, that was on television show last night. And, it was a television show where they got the spy cameras everywhere. Oh, um, I've seen that show. Yeah, I mean, no one's actually physically done that, but 
we proved at Georgia Tech not too long ago that I, I can you know slam on your brakes, I can turn on your windshield wipers, I can uh, turn on your heater real high, I can uh, turn off your engine, lock your doors every time you unlock them, I'd relock them, uh, and and I, I actually talked to a couple of senators who were actually holding hearings on that, and they had been assured by the people in uh, Michigan that that couldn't be done. But you know, Mark, you you, you should be okay, right? Because most most of your cars, the cars in your collection, still have carburetors. Uh, yeah, most of my most of my car collection predates 1977. So yeah, so you you're fine. You're fine. Well, Nobody's gonna have to have. <laughs> yeah, unless you're getting underneath there and installing some servos that I'm not aware of. <laughs> the, the EPA will come after you, Mark. Yeah. Yes, well, you yes, I've got a different issue. Yes. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, mine's I, an '87, so yeah, no, no, mine's the you, same way. If your car, if your car has a carburetor and a bench, hey guys, hold on, I got to kiss my wife. Bye. Oh. <laughs> uh oh, what happened? Anyway, um, so that yeah, that, that's a that's a scary topic. Um, I thank but, all uh, the Prius owners for saving the gasoline for me. <laughs> hey, uh, you know, Paul, in your part of the world, they've actually come up with a uh, an EMP device, a focused EMP device uh, that's actually being made for law enforcement um, worldwide, and it's actually been tested in London or UK, uh, outside of London, North London, and um, so almost any vehicle after 2005 uh, is susceptible to a controlled EMP pulse. Um, other some cars like BMWs and other cars that were made around 2002, Mercedes, some of them are also, you know, a, are vulnerable to an EMP, a focused EMP. But anything pre, pretty much anything pre 1999, 2000 is, would have to take our huge EMP pulse to shut them down. I mean, it would have to be a, we call a physical burn pulse. Uh, yeah. Of course, the person inside would probably die from the radiation pulse, but. So I guess my ultimate question is, if you can guarantee me security on my car, why can't you guarantee me security on my bank account? It's like I said last night to the students, there's no such thing as security. Security is invisibility. If you can be invisible on the Internet, you can be fairly secure. Uh, I don't understand people putting money into Internet banks that don't physically exist. Uh, I, there is no security. I'm sorry. I don't care. I mean, they just came out, what was it, two weeks ago and said that uh, most of your vi antivirus protection was less than 35% effective. Even the ones that are updated daily, okay, uh, are less than 50% capable of blocking you from having getting attacked. Uh, What's and like, you got to be constantly vo uh, visible. Visual, What's excuse like, me, look at this up. Go ahead, Casey. It's like we were talking about before the show started, like Paul said, I mean, the only way to guarantee security is to lock the computer down where you can't use it. Right. Turn it off. Hide it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, there's a, there's a, a thing on the Internet I saw the other day, and it says, uh, hackers to demonstrate a $20 uh, um, device that can turn your car into a hacked zombie. And see, that's the other. What, what, let's just say that they do find a way to manipulate these cars running around with endless wireless at connectivity. Yeah. Well, and I don't know. I don't know about you, Paul, but you know, with these guys talking like this, that that, that those martinis that's waiting for us uh, start to look really <laughs> tempting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so why don't we why don't we let you do what you have to do and then let you get that. Uh, that uh, adult beverage that you've been waiting for. <laughs> okay, thanks. So I thought this week uh, I'd tell you a case story. Um, we've been looking at uh, an IP telephony issue for a customer. Um, they've had a problem where intermittently they get very poor audio quality on their IP um, telephone calls. and. Um, once we've found the root cause of this, I think you'll find it quite interesting because it's, uh, it's quite bizarre. So I have prepared some slides. I'm sorry about this. I don't wish to PowerPoint you to death, but I thought I'd just uh, set the scene here. So the issue that our customer faced was that uh, they have a couple of locations, uh, one in a place called Birmingham, which is not 
the one in Alabama, it's Birmingham in in, uh, in the Midlands here in the UK, and one in a place called Aylesbury. And what happened was that uh, calls between Birmingham and Aylesbury were subject to a certain amount of corruption, and you just got uh, some terrible audio quality. The problem was intermittent, but it happened many times per day, and quite strangely, it only affected the audio from Birmingham to Aylesbury. It didn't affect the audio in the opposite direction. So that's the, that's the symptom information. The actual configuration looked like this, and I hope this is visible to you all. Um, so we've got a telephone you can see in Birmingham. We have a wide area network that takes us to a London data center. We go through a firewall, through a, a device called a fabric extender, which is a Cisco device, and into a pair of Cisco 5500 switches, Nexus 5500s, sorry, not Catalyst. Um, and then off of one of the um, Nexus switches, we've got a link out to the Aylesbury site. And that's basically what we call in the UK a LAN extension, but it's running at LAN speed and probably just some sort of multiplexed fiber. Um, the call management system is run on a, in another site, uh, which you see there, which are the small orange boxes. Um, they're not involved in the path for the audio stream. So the audio simply leaves Birmingham, goes through the MPLS cloud, through the firewall, through the fabric extender, through the switches, and then back out to Aylesbury. Now one thing about, I, I am no Cisco expert, but one thing I know about uh, the Nexus switches and fabric extenders is typically the fabric extenders are dual attached into a pair of switches. Um, in this case, the customer was in a transitory position and they'd only attached one leg of the fabric extender into the switch. So that's why we see one, one connection out of the FEX is just dangling in midair. So that's the configuration. Um, at, at a routing layer, we had uh, a VLAN that was uh, defined across both switches and then we had another um, what's called a VPC peer link virtual port channel peer link connecting the two switches as well. So that's the basic configuration. So what happened, sorry, and, and the uh, routers were acting as uh, VPC gateway partners. So what this means is this is Cisco's new technology to provide you with a great deal of resilience in your network by having routers that can act on behalf of each other depending on if they detect a failure. So this is uh, the next step beyond HSRP if you like. That's as good as I can tell you anyway. One other thing that I should tell you is that um, both of these uh, routers in the switches were advertising a route to Aylesbury um, and that was being seen by the firewall. So we needed a diagnostic capture plan. How are we going to capture data that we need at the time the problem occurred? So what we decided was that we'd place a number of network analyzers along the path of the audio uh, stream. We'd sit with some users in Aylesbury. We'd wait for the problem to occur. And when it occurred, we'd send some form of marker into the network to, to enable us to find the data quite quickly. We'd analyze the data. And if we needed to, we'd move our capture points and, and re, uh, uh, do the whole thing over again. Luckily, we found that uh, in the first capture, we were actually able to identify the cause of the problem quite quickly. So this is the, where we put the analyzers. And what we found was that at the time the user experienced the voice quality problem, we could see duplicate packets at the analyzer that was sitting in the Aylesbury office. And as we went back and tracked through the network, we found that there were no duplicates coming from Birmingham. There were no duplicate packets arriving in the data center, but we could see the duplicates on the VPC peer link between the two routers. And so that led us to believe that the problem was somewhere in the vicinity of that first switch, switch number one. So this is the really crazy thing. This is the bit that we really struggled with, the duplicate packets. If you look at the time difference between the original packet and the duplicate, 
Um, sorry, I forgot to tell you this is affecting UDP and TCP traffic. So the time difference between the original packet and the duplicate packet was sometimes as high as 145 seconds. So you've got to ask yourself, where on earth were these packets going for 145 seconds? So we thought this must be some device attached to switch one that's causing this problem. So we decided to run our tests again and basically we installed uh, another analyzer. But what I can tell you is that when the data comes in from the uh, MPLS cloud and comes through the FEX, we could see that the destination MAC address was pointing the data at the routing function on switch number two. But the, um, the functionality of the Nexus switch and the VPC peering means that the first switch would grab that packet, realize it was for a VPC peer, and then send it across the peer link. And uh, it was across this peer link that we were seeing the duplicates. The duplicates were absolutely binary, identical to each other. So they were complete, identical copies. So we added this additional capture point into the whole equation. And what we did was we tried to look to see if we could see where this data was being duplicated and was coming in on any of the ports on the switch. But we couldn't find anything. So this is purely a problem within the switch. We couldn't find any external factors that were affecting this. And um, so at that point, the customer decided they needed a workaround because they'd been suffering this problem quite a while. So what they did was they switched off the advertising of the route to Aylesbury from switch number two. That caused everything to go via switch number one and the problem went away. So we're now left with a situation where the problem is now being pursued by the Cisco partner who uh, installed and maintains the switches. We don't know the answer yet. All we do know is that these duplicate packets are causing a problem with the voice quality. They're not causing any problems with the data systems, even though we can see duplicate packets uh, affecting the data systems, because those systems are using TCP, and TCP is more robust, and it's just throwing away the duplicates. So uh, it's not affecting data, but it is affecting voice. I knew very little about VPC and all those types of things, but I can tell you there's quite a lot of information on the internet, as you'd expect. Um, there's a, certainly a Cisco guide to um, virtual port channel and how the peering works. And also the traffic that travels across the peer link is encapsulated in something called data center ethernet or sometimes referred to as data center bridging. And you can find some information about that on Wikipedia. Um, DCE is not like the standard VLAN tagging. It's uh, slightly different. So whereas we're all used to looking at tagged VLAN traffic, the DCE uh, format is slightly different and works in a slightly different way. So that's my little discussion piece. I just thought it was an interesting problem, quite a bizarre problem, particularly the, uh, the 145 second delays, which we still don't know the reason uh, why that's happening. Um, and I do wonder if this is a problem that's, um, it could be a, config a strange configuration problem, although the configuration has been checked by several people and nobody can spot the issue. Um, other than that, it could be a bug somewhere in the code in the Nexus switch. And I do wonder if people aren't uh, experiencing this because one, they don't uh, singly attach fabric extenders. They always use dual attachment, which is how you should run them. And also, even if you did have the problem, if you only had the problem with data systems, you wouldn't uh, experience any um, symptom because TCP will simply uh, just throw away the duplicates. You, so, you can always do like some people buy a duplicate filter, a duplicate packet yeah. filtering device, and then ignore it. But it's still a problem on your network, and it still causes horrific. And most of the time, when you see these VLANs stacked like that in the, the way that Cisco does them, you will see duplicate packets uh, routed around. And how they take 145 seconds, that one is uh, amazing. Uh, did you, When you did your monitoring, did you monitor through a span port or did you monitor through a tap? 
uh, span port. Um, yeah, which which means you're not, your timing is all screwed up. You realize that because yeah, your span port grooms it, all the it, data. It's close enough for what we need. I mean, it's um, we I, I understand the, that there are some inaccuracies with using span ports, but uh, for us, typically we're worried about longer response times than. Um, are impacted by the delays in a spam port. I mean, the thing is, the, the problem for us is that you can imagine you go into a site and they've got a working network, and for me to say to them, I just want to break into your inter-switch links to install, install this tap, uh, it's just not going to fly. So typically we, oh, have, yeah. we have to use spam ports. Um, well, but with RTP, you do realize that spam ports do groom all the data, so it, as long as you know that. Yeah. I mean, we, not, we, we, do use, we do use taps. Um, we use taps quite a lot, but um, often we do have to use spam ports. And in this case, you know, the 145 seconds, that's what makes me think this isn't a config issue. You know, uh -uh. It's, not, it's not every single packet that's delayed. Don't get me wrong. This is a, it happens intermittently, and it happens uh, over a random sample of packets. But you can see that at sometimes it's delayed by 145 seconds, and then suddenly it will be delayed by almost zero, almost no delay, you just see the immediate duplicate, and then it goes back up to 145, and it's cycling on a four-hour cycle. So it will be 145 seconds for three hours, it will drop to zero for an hour, and then it will go back up to 145 seconds for another three hours. And so it keeps cycling around. It's not so a vacuole. You're not using a vacuole out of the switches, are you? No. Okay. No. So it's, it's just a straight VLAN configuration with the. Uh, uh, it's VLAN, but it's got VPC peering, which is. VPC, okay, peering, okay. Which is slightly different. Because uh, you see that with VACL all the time, where they'll, you'll get a random duplicate frame come through. Okay. Uh, well, that's worth VLAN, it. Yeah, the VLAC tables, you'll see that periodically. But I've never, and, and I'm, I agree with you, uh, while you were talking, I was reading about some of the problems that Nexus has had. Um, and it is code based in Nexus, so I got a suspicion you you found a bug. Yeah. Uh, in it. Yeah. That's that's real interesting. It. You know, real time protocols. A friend of mine used to always jokingly say he's a physicist, right? So there is no real time, right? Yeah. And and <laughs> uh, yeah, so it it real time protocols can drive you crazy. Mark, is that true? Very true. Very very true. I was just thinking through the you know different questions you know you know were you able to observe on the the nexus I uh, didn't know if you had any uh, access to it or not to see if the CPU utilization on it was up or how it was managing its uh, QSQs because I'm a, I'm assuming that a, a few things yeah uh, that would come to mind for me would be CPU on the, on the devices um, QS is it starving a queue. Uh, you know, is there too much data in it? Um, and uh, yeah, and the, the heartbeats were working okay. Uh, the 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 heartbeats, I'm not sure about. Um, they did look at um, CPU utilization both across the whole switch and process utilization, mm -hmm. and they couldn't spot any patterns that would in indicate a particular process was having a problem. Right. Um, I'm not sure what else was done because I didn't do the problem directly myself, and also uh, there was a supplier involved who was the Cisco specialist. You know, yeah. our, our guy was uh, there to troubleshoot and narrow the problem to a box. You know, uh, and then we we engage with um, a Cisco somebody who knows something about. It. Although we've got a colleague, he he actually helps a lot, and he's uh, he's very uh, um, you know capable Cisco guy. So. Um, sounds like a bug, though. I agree with Tim. It sounds like a bug in the product. Actually, there is. I just got a. I just looked it up. Uh, the Cisco NXOS software has some fundamental concepts where you can have what they say uh, uh, VPC and routing concurrent coexistence does present problems in the same switch for duplicate packets. Okay. Well, that's interesting. That's interesting. So um, it's actually in a Cisco node. Um, okay. Well, perhaps you could send me the link to that at some point, Tim. I'll, <laughs> I'll pass it on to my colleagues. Oh, this has been worthwhile. I don't, I don't regret not going for a drink now. Actually. <laughs> yeah, it talks about it talks about slow, 
and again, I'm reading it real fast, but it does talk about uh, slow delays and long delays, and I'm reading it real fast. Uh, something in one of the options when you set up the um, software, and I am now I'm out of my depth because I'm not. Mark, this will be something for you because I'm not a software person. I, if it does, if I can't fix it with a hammer, then I don't want to fix it. <laughs> well, you know, I, I, I was I was listening to uh, to Paul's uh, uh, description, it, but it kept reminding me of uh, back in the days when we used to fix old cars, right, Mark? That when it doesn't run well, you start throwing away parts. Yeah. <laughs> right, and then it just runs better, and then you say, "Okay, well, the problem is solved." <laughs> well, you know, Paul's diagram that he put up reminded me of basic, you know, uh, circuit testing. You know, I've got, you know, in the old car analogy, Danny, my brake lights don't work. You know, Who where needs brake light? Come on, you don't need that. Right? Just, just throw it away. I just put my arm down. You know, yeah, exactly. I expect that, right? You yeah, know? and you don't scare the horses that way. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, I, tell you, I tell you the thing that I found strange because, because you know, I'm way out of date with this stuff. But the bit that really threw me was when they described to me how you you have a packet. It's got a destination MAC address that's across a VLAN in another switch, and somehow the Nexus grabs that packet and says, "No, I've got a better way to get to that other switch. I'll just take that off the uh, network and I'll forward it across my VPC peer link." And what what's even worse is it's not even doing it at layer two, which it would have done had it have just been a standard Catalyst 5000. Right. It's doing it at layer three because when you check the TTL count, it drops by two from the time it hits the first nexus and the time it comes out of the second nexus. The count, the TTL count has dropped by two, so it's been routed through two routing functions. And yet, if it had have just gone across on the VLAN, it would have only gone through one, one routing function. Yeah. So this is all just... Oh, this just blew my mind, I tell you. That and the 145 second delay, I just thought, I don't understand this. I need yeah, to that's, actually, that's what I blew my mind. Technology that, like that, uh, Paul, uh, you know, at, at a former employer, uh, there's a lot of uh, different switch manufacturers out there now that have been playing with that layer three resiliency uh, where they will intercept L2, you know, packets at L2, but considering the L3 header going, I've got yeah. a better way to get there. Yeah. I mean, it goes all the way back to 1996 with Cabletron and some of its secure fast technologies. Uh, and what we've seen is it's just maturing and you know, you know, coming out in Cisco and all the other different manufacturers in different ways. Yeah, yeah. And then we've got software-defined networks coming along as well. So Absolutely. So yeah, Cisco be... actually puts in here one of their comments is change the TTL. You know the the time to live, okay. Uh, and which is strange because to me that's kind of like fixing the fence after the cow's gotten out. But yeah, I mean, if you fix it for one type of packet, it's going to change all of those frames. Yeah, because changing the TTL, you'd have to go around and reconfigure all your servers and PCs and everything, that's, wouldn't you? I'm I'm reading right here Cisco NXOS software virtual port channel fundamental concepts, and I'm going to send you this, okay. Yeah, okay. uh, but but I, I'm sure I'm sure Tim, if you skip down to the bottom, the solution uh, that Cisco would suggest is to just buy a bigger switch. Definitely, definitely. <laughs> it, it's a software problem. You you didn't update your software on time to them or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been teaching a course today, and and some of the members on the some of the people on the course are convinced there's a conspiracy between Microsoft, the hardware vendors, and Cisco to just drive more and more hardware. You know. Well, you looked out Intel, don't forget, right? Yeah, yeah, and Intel. Sorry. Yeah, I also have to send you, I'll send you something I just got from Intel. I'll send it to Casey, too, and Mark, too, uh, where they actually say, oh, we understand that we've opened the back door for everybody, but you read this huge paper about how to turn it off. And it, <laughs> it is distressing to know that it's, it's it's going to be a pain in the you know what. Yeah. Hey guys, I'm looking at the calendar, and uh, February is a short month. So next week, next Wednesday, will be the last show of February, and I understand that Tony might be back. 
but then um, after that, Paul tells me that that he'll be gone. So next week might might be the only week where Tony and and Paul get to do the show together for a while. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I won't be gone for good. <laughs> I, I understand. I understand. <laughs> <laughs> I understand. I understand. None, none of us are. None of us are. Don't worry. <laughs> okay. But, and you might, you might even be able to call in from Australia. Who knows? Yeah, it will just be about two o'clock in the morning. That's all. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> and you just have to talk funny too. Yeah. Okay, well, before we, uh, well, that was a great, that was a, that was a great presentation, Paul. Really, I, I learned something. It was um, really good. Yeah, I like it. I like it. Thank you for that. Um, okay. Any, um, any comment before we close the show? We're, we're a little bit past uh, half an hour now. Any no. comment, anyone? Casey, you've been quiet. Hey, I, I didn't want to get on my conspiracy theories. <laughs> 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 I'm good. Okay, thank you, Casey. Mark, before uh, we it, let you out, no. it's just a brilliant demonstration of, of standard diagnostics. You know, something that uh, you know somehow you can't teach it sometimes, but uh, you know, I understand Paul's working at teaching that. And, uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, you know, end to end, you just can't go end to end. You got to touch everything in between and and look and see how things change. That's uh, it's brilliant. Great presentation. I remember back in the old IBM days when IBM would come in to fix a problem, it would suddenly <laughs> disappear, and IBM, you'd ask them what happened. They said, "Oh, it was nothing. There was, you, you fixed some, you said something wrong, and then of course they just walk out." And so I, I kind of sometimes see Cisco, Intel, Microsoft doing that kind of uh, mysterious uh, solution, and then, and certainly never saying it was our fault. I mean, that would be a mortal sin. So, um, yeah. Yeah, well, I started at IBM. That's where I get all my ideas from. So, <laughs> so um, Paul, why don't you close your show today? Oh, you got me to do it last week. Oh, okay. Well, then, well, why don't you do it again now that you have some practice? <laughs> That's right. Yeah, now that you got practice, do it again. <laughs> okay. Well, let's close the show then and um, look out for. Um, do we have a, a Homeland Security this week, or is it we, we're uh, skipping a week? Yeah? We're skipping a week. Yeah, so it'll be we're next skipping week. A week. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. Um, please do join us next week on um, Love My Tool TV, and uh, we'll see you soon. And Paul, be sure to come back with a solution. Okay. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> okay, that, we'll close the show. Thank you, everyone. See you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. Hasta luego. -bye. Bye.